and there we got it. You can see an address, you can hear a voice, you can see a picture. So you may reasonably assume that it's Monday. Nah, scratch that. You can reasonably assume that it is Tuesday. No, 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 definitely not Tuesday. I think what you can reasonably assume is that it is a Wednesday and that you are tuned into Tent Talks Tunes, baby. That's right. I'm back. I'm in the black, at least for right now. What I'm about to discuss is not whack. It's not really an attack. It's definitely not slack. And I just keep on coming back because that's the way I roll, baby. Every Wednesday, Lord willing, and the creeks don't rise, and provided that I am indeed in the vicinity of Danbury, Connecticut, it's Tents Talks Tunes. Tent Talks Tunes. Let me adjust my camera angle just a little bit. Looks like I'm a little bit crooked. Let's straighten my act out, shall we? Using this wonderful tripod thing that I've got. Yeah, there we go. We're slowly getting it. I'm very fond of keeping the spirit of cable access TV alive. You get to see all this technological stuff happening live on Facebook as it happens every Wednesday and archived forever on my permanent record, not only on Facebook, but also on YouTube, where you can go to the Malcolm Tent YouTube channel and take a look at tonight's episode or episodes from days gone by or live concert videos of me and my many bands or some of the shoot interviews I've done in the past. There's a lot of me on my YouTube channel. So if you like to have a lot of me in your life virtually, by all means, go to the Malcolm Tent YouTube channel. Let's grab the monitor and see who's tuned in and who's uh, digging what I'm laying down right now. Oh, we got some people there. We got Ms. Gelman from Tucson, Arizona. We got Mike Lesser from Vancouver, British Columbia. We've got Pear from the great nation of Sweden. And we got Larry from Connecticut and Sandra and a few others watching as well. Welcome aboard, guys. Yes, indeed, Mike has uh, said, do not adjust your set. This is the actual color of shirt I'm wearing. It's a scientific fact that people perceive colors differently from one another. But I think everybody can agree that whatever you perceive this as, it is indeed neon orange. Why do I wear the neon orange? Because I want people to notice me, duh. That's all I want. I want people to notice me in my gallon of Danbury tap water. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Ah. So all you MT maniacs out there who are paying attention and have a, a good sense of continuity will have noticed that I was not live on the air with Tent Talks Tunes last week. Teacher, I have a good excuse. I have a perfectly valid excuse as to why I was not on the airwaves last week, why I was absent, why I was not at my post. I was doing other duties centered around the 39-year heavyweight champions of rock and roll, the almighty anti-scene, baby. We had ourselves a bodacious hometown gig in Charlotte, North Carolina, which occurred last Friday. So I had to go down to Charlotte in order to rehearse and get into the swing of that particular thing so that we could rock the socks off of the audience at the Tipsy Burrow in Charlotte, which is exactly what we did last Friday, May 20th. It was a great show. Definitely one for the books. It was epical. We had people who traveled from Hickory, North Carolina and Quebec, Montreal, and from all points in between. Lots of people came great distances to watch us do our thing and we really appreciate that and i think that um, by common consensus we did the job not to say that we did the job in the sense of a preliminary professional wrestler but we got the job done to the satisfaction of all attendees both young both old both near 
both far, people who were seeing their first ever anti-scene show, of which there were quite a few, and people who were long-time veterans of anti-scene gigs, of which there were also quite a few. So to make that sort of wide variety of people that happy with our brand of Destructo Rock was very gratifying. So thank you everybody who came out. And um, if you missed it, too bad, Bubby. You're going to have to wait a while for the next anti-scene live experience or pretty much any Malcolm Tent live experience, um, which leads us right into the fact that usually at the start of the show, I'd like to check the calendar and the bulletin board. Nothing on the calendar. The calendar is blank except for one very crucial date for yours truly, and that is July 21st when I'm getting this wrist of mine operated on. Yes. Anybody who knows me or has known me for a very long time knows that this wrist of mine is not as good as it looks. It's got this thing about being in constant pain just about 24 hours a day. And um, long story short, if you really want the long story, maybe someday I'll tell it. Short story is I broke it when I was 19 years old and I didn't know it was broken. So it never healed properly. And so for the last almost 39 years, uh, the bones have been sort of floating around in there and rubbing against each other. And there's been a lot of attrition and atrophy accompanied by really bad pain and loss of mobility. So July 21st, I'm going under, I don't know if it's gonna be the knife or the laser or whatever it is these newfangled doctors use these days, but I'm gonna get my wrist fixed finally. And the prognosis is very good. The surgeon who I've been talking to is extremely hopeful about it. He says that when it's all done, I should have increased mobility, increased flexibility, and way, way decreased pain, which translates into better bass playing and better guitar playing, because this is my fret hand. And um, my entire career, I've been playing sort of encumbered. So I'm looking very forward to getting a little bit of function back in this wrist. And I think the results will pay off musically very quickly. So that's cool. The problem is that right now it just hurts when I play. It's like really super painful when I play. If I tape it up and put some tight wristbands on, I can make it through a set okay. But the pain is only going to increase, and that's just not good. So we're, I'm laying off the gigs for the next six weeks or so, and then after that, I'm going to need about six weeks or so of recovery time. And after that, I can start thinking about playing shows, whether it be with Anti-Scene or The Bloody Apostles or They Hate Us or Ultra Bunny or as my own dude as a solo acoustic punk rocker. And I really hope to be back in the saddle by the end of 2022. So how's that for a piece of news? Hmm. Let's see what the people think about the news here on my special monitor. Ah, yes. Eric says he's got problems with his wrist as well. And uh, ah, Bob from Muskegon, Michigan says he's also wearing an orange shirt as he perceives it. Coincidence? Or is there something larger at play right here? It's beyond me. I have no idea. Greetings to Kit E. Cat from North Carolina and all others whose names are not revealing themselves on my monitor. Okay, that's the bulletin board and that's the calendar all in once. Let's check the mailbox. Let's see what kind of goodies have arrived in the mail. We already opened up by showing you a shot of my address, Malcolm Tent, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut. Truly, one of the only things I have to look forward to every day is going to the mailbox and seeing what's in it. Without a full mailbox, I have a dreary and empty life. And you guys don't want me to have a dreary and empty life now, do you? Do you? Tell me you don't. Please, please tell me you don't want that to happen to me. Please, I'm begging you. I'm begging you. <sighs> Ain't too proud to beg. So yeah, let's see what came in the mail. I've been gone for 11 days or so, and uh, core blimey, I found a few really cool things in the mailbox. This first one, I have to reach over and grab a pair of scissors. 
is from a Maine dog, Scott, in El Paso, Texas. I do not know what this is. This is a sealed envelope. Please do not fold or bend. Open carefully, it says. And it is sealed. So you guys are going to find out what I'm about to find out. I don't know what's in this thing. So, woo, check it out. we got the Million Mile Scissors, and even the handles on the Million Mile Scissors are not as eye-gouging as my shirt. Look how dull those handles are compared to my shirt. My shirt is entertaining, my scissors are not. But they got a million miles on them. Each mile earned one envelope at a time. So let's see if we can get one million miles and one foot on these scissors. As we open up this envelope, made out of some kind of pesky, ultra durable space age material. I have no idea what this synthetic material is. Mm, okay, I see a lot of packing. I see a letter, which I'm going to read in the privacy of my own home. Piece of packing material. Oh, okay. This is very cool. This is very cool. I saw a teaser of this on Jeff Clayton's Tuesday Facebook show entitled Break On Through in which JC talks about cool things relating to anti-scene and the world at large. And this dude, Scott, sent Jeff some really cool, amazing art. And that, my friends, is Alice Cooper. And that is great. That is real art, my friends. Hand done, handmade, pencil with ink highlights, signed by the artist. Don't know if this is a print or if he did this by hand. I guess I'll find out when I uh, actually read the letter. It's got smudges and smears on the back, so that indicates to me that this is a real hand-drawn portrait of the coop. That is fantastic. Scott, thank you so very much. Much obliged. I will be framing this and hanging it in my home very, very soon. And as is my tradition, I'm going to send you something in return unless your letter states that you don't want nothing in return. In which case, I just might do it anyway, because I'm a scoff law, that's why. So this is, this is great. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Scott somehow knows that I am a giant fan of Alice Cooper, not just the solo artist, but the group. Cooper, Alice, the singer, and Alice Cooper, the group. If you don't know the difference between the two, look it up. There's a big difference. They're both pretty cool, but there's a big difference between Alice Cooper, the group, and Cooper, comma, Alice, the lead singer. Facts. All right, what else came in the mail? We got some cool stuff. I have been extolling the virtues of print media forever, and sure enough, Razor Cake, which has been in print for probably over 10 years at this point, sent me a copy of their zine. And I haven't read it yet. I only got it today, but I am stoked. Because, you know, blogs are cool, and websites are cool, and the internet is cool. But actually picking up a physical object and leafing through it, and smelling the newsprint, and, you know, maybe getting a little bit of ink on your fingers, reading the ads, reading the reviews, this to me is what it's all about. Look at that. Advertisements in the famous one-sixth of a page format is popularized by Maximum Rock and Roll many, many, many years ago. I'm taking a trip back to a very good place. I'm in a very good place right now, but I'm taking a trip back to another very good place. So Razor Cake, thank you very much for sending me this magazine. And I already know y'all don't want anything in return, but it's the thought that counts. Let's see, we got some people here. Oh yes, 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 yes. What else did I get in the mail? I got, check this out. This is a another physical media. This is an actual, honest to God, promo CDR but from my pals in the Human Adult Band from New Hope, Pennsylvania. These guys are kindred spirits with my band Ultra Bunny. They're old, they're loud, they're sludgy as hell, and they just do not G-A-F. And they've got a brand new album out called No Five Vultures which I got in the mail, and I have not had a chance to hear it yet, but I'm excited to do this. If you guys want a heaping helping of distortion and lo-fi hospitality, check out the Human Adult Band. They get my seal of approval. Thank you, Human Adult Band. 
I'll probably be sending something to you soon. What else came in the mail? Well, we have this mysterious envelope from uh, my pal Mike Lesser, lead singer, former lead singer of the Gay Cowboys in Bondage, who I've talked about an awful lot here on Tent Talks Tunes. Mike and I have reconnected after many, many years of not being connected, proving that Facebook is good for something after all. So we've reconnected. We've become great pals. Um, love the guy. He is probably watching right now. Don't let it go to your head, Mike. <laughs> I'm actually in the middle of doing a Malcolm Tent shoot interview with Mike about the gay cowboys in bondage who were a big, big influence on me when I was a young lad in Florida, both musically, attitudinally, and the way that they released their music definitely, definitely inspired me greatly. Um, in fact, inspired me so much that there is going to be available, I think it might even be available now, I don't remember if I've posted it for sale anywhere, but actual legit reissue of the Gay Cowboys in Bondage discography, the We're Not Gay But The Music Is demo, the Owen Marshmallow Strikes Again 7-inch, and a big handful of unreleased bonus cuts on Genuine Cassette and Genuine CD on my label, TPOS. I'm pretty sure I put it on Discogs. It will. It is definitely on Bandcamp right now. Go to Bandcamp and check out Gay Cowboys and Bondage, and I'll have it listed on eBay sooner than later. So that's the product. That's what Mike has helped me with, and let's see what he sent me in the mail. Got the Million Mile Scissors. Got the Space Age Envelope. Let's cut this sucker open and have a cold reveal of the contents. You might think doing a cold reveal of a sealed envelope could be kind of risky, but I've known Mike for a long time. I trust the dude. There it is. The envelope is open. The product comes out. Very well packed. Look at that packaging. That's a lot of packaging. For what I'm going to guess are some CDs. I can do this. I can get it open. I'm a smart guy. Right, let's see there. Mm, nice Canadian Ziploc bag. I wonder if the Canadian Ziploc bag is different from the American Ziploc bag. I'll have to do an A-B comparison at some point. And then we open this up and ah, there you go. Discs. What are they? You, may, you might ask. I might ask too. What do we got? Ah, some very, very early, early recordings of the Gay Cowboys in Bondage live, which are not going to be released. We already know that. Not going to be released. But I'm an archivist and a collector. So there you go. And then another disc of F. That's all it says. F. If you're from Florida, you know what F is. If you're not from Florida, I'm here to tell you that F were one of the most controversial, divisive, and divided bands ever to come of South, out of South Florida, maybe anywhere at all in the universe. Long story short, there were two Fs. They started out as one F, and both Fs definitely have their merits. I have a definite preference for the other F. But I'm not going to say which because I'm a diplomat. But that is an eps that is definitely article worthy, interview worthy. Someone's got to talk about that at length if they haven't already. So I'm just going to sort of put that out there. Mike, thank you for the F and thank you for the Gay Cowboys in Bondage for the personal archive stuff that I will be listening to for a good long time from here on out. Mazel tov. And I got one more envelope that came in the mail. I actually did open this one up. This is my, for my good pal Dennis in Mobile, Alabama. Dennis is the head American honcho for Jack Hammer Records. Jack Hammer Records is a Japanese label with an American branch, and Dennis runs the American branch. Jack Hammer Records is a fine label. Not only do they release stuff by Anti-Scene, but they also release a lot of stuff from Japan, a lot of punk, a lot of hardcore, a lot of metal, and everything that they do is a very high quality product with like beautiful graphics, with OB strips, with all the things that make us collectors totally mark out, geek out, freak out, 
and want to jump out of our very of our very skins. So Dennis is a very observant fellow. He's heard me talk about my love for coin collecting. And wouldn't you know it, he was apparently doing some house cleaning in the, the home of a deceased relative, if I got the story correct. And he came across some random coins and just sent me some of these random coins, man. Coins from the Bahamas, coins from Germany, a repro of the Maria Teresa Thaler, which is dated 17, I forget what, but they never, they never changed the dates. This is a great piece of numismatic trivia. I just love this stuff. The Maria Teresa Thaler. If any of you guys wondered where the term dollar comes from, it comes from this very coin, the Maria Teresa, Maria Teresa Thaler. This was one of the original, what they used to call crown-sized silver coins. And you'll notice, if you hold it up to an American silver dollar, one of which Dennis was also kind enough to send me, they are almost identical in size. So the American dollar coin, which used to be made out of silver, was based completely on the Maria Teresa Thaler. And this, for very, very many years, was the world standard of trade. Merchants would travel the world spreading these Maria Teresa Thalers in exchange for goods. And I forget which culture it was, but there was one culture that would not accept them if anything at all had been altered on the coin. And that included the date. So whatever the year was, okay, 1780, the year that the Maria Teresa, Maria Teresa Thaler was introduced was 1780, and I, I might have been the Chinese, I'm not sure, but let's just say the Chinese. The Chinese would not accept a Maria Teresa Thaler unless it had the exact same date as the ones that originally were spent in their country in trade. So, after an unsus unsuccessful attempt to pass off Maria Teresa Thalers with dates other than 1780, they were minted in, pre in perpetuity with the same date. Didn't matter what year they were minted in, in, they all said 1780. And the Maria Teresa Thaler was the basis of the Spanish Eight Reales piece, about the same size, about the same weight, same composition, and that was the most widely used coin in the early American colonies because the mother country of Great Britain was so busy paying for wars that they couldn't send any hard coinage over to the colonies. So what circulated in the colonies were mostly Spanish milled dollars, which took their name from the Fowler. That is numismatic history. This is Tent Talks. How do you make an N? Anybody out there know how to make an N with your hand? I don't know. I'm sure somebody can do it. Tent talks numismatics, baby. It's happening right here, right now, for you. Records are not the only cool round objects. Coins are very cool and very round and very objectified. So yeah, Maria Teresa Thaler. And of course, another extremely cool round object is the Grand Funk sticker that he threw in there from the OG pressings of We're an American Band. Yeah! And some crusty CD. Can't read the name of it, but there it is. This is some wild, noisy shite from Thailand. And also some very cool paper money, including these very, very strange and topical. Let's see, where is it? A five peso note from the Japanese government. This was occupation money for the Philippines, I believe. And the Japanese government printed up lots of these. And they are based, if you know what old American $5 bills look like, completely based on the American $5 bill. They were probably printed at the American, at the U.S. Banknote Company in New York City before hostilities broke out between the U.S. and Japan. Pretty neat. It's worth about three cents, but it's really, really cool. I remember my grandparents had a lot of these, and they were like World War II veterans on the home front. And I don't know, I guess the, the Japanese occupation money got imported into the U.S. in large quantities as souvenirs because they were, they were around a lot when I was a kid. This is great stuff. And packaged somewhat carefully in a fold-out piece of cardboard 
a very fragile, well-worn, yet still beautiful Confederate $100 note from 1864. It's probably authentic. If it's not authentic, it's a contemporary counterfeit. I don't know, but either way, it's effing cool. Real American history you can hold in your hands. So thank you, Dennis, very much for that. I've sent Dennis so much stuff in the past, I don't know how I would reciprocate, but I'm going to think of something. I got to think of something I haven't sent Dennis already. That's kind of a tough one. Dennis, if you got requests, let me know. Let's see if people have something to say about this week's haul. Daniel, my good pal Dan from Dan Barry wants to know what's up with Devo. I don't know. They played New York City and I was on the road and I had to miss them. Harumph. Hello, Neil. Hello, Vaughn. And hello to the other people whose names I can't see. Thanks for tuning in. Whew. All right, we've been talking about coins so much, we better get back to the tunes. I will just mention that I came back with um, some of the fun swag from playing a gig with a band. Set lists. And I also spent the day after the gig working on a super secret, super secret recording project with Jeff Clayton from the Almighty Anti-Scene. I'm not going to tell you anything about it just yet, but I will give you a very quick flashcard clue, okay? Flash flashcard clue number one. Flashcard clue number two. That's all you get. You'll be hearing more about that sooner than later. All right, gang. Now let's really talk tunes. Let's talk about some of the really cool stuff I picked up while I was on the road. Not to say that it was on the road. These things were in record stores. I've mentioned it before, I'll mention it again. Because of my label, TPOS, which can of course be found on Discogs, eBay, and Bandcamp, I make the rounds. Whenever I play a show, I book an itinerary that takes me through as many towns as I can with as many record stores in them. And I bring lots of TPOS product, which I sell to record stores. And whenever somebody buys enough stuff from me and I can afford to do it, I'll take some stuff in trade. I'm always looking to take things in trade that I can resell, but I'll occasionally pick up some things in trade that are just for little old me. And they usually can be found in the cheap bin because I haunt the cheap bin. That's the favorite. That's my favorite part of the store. The dollar bin, the two dollar bin. It's where you find the cheap stuff. So my first stop was a Lunchbox Records in Charlotte, North Carolina. And Scott, the dude who runs the place, was a super cool dude. He bought a bunch of stuff. I had a little bit of a positive trade balance, so I picked up some good cheap records. I mean, for one dollar, for one buck. I got this really interesting pressing by the uh, crazy world of Arthur Brown. A double A side. I put a spell on you on one side and nightmare on the other. And my eye was drawn to this because it's got a completely cheesy, generic Track Records label. Now, Track Records was the label that The Who started in the late 60s, early 70s. And um, I'm going to guess that Trek couldn't find a pressing plant to handle their output for whatever reason. So they went to this one pressing plant. I don't know the name of the pressing plant, but this pressing plant had only one layout for all of their product. And it was this exact layout, all generic. Everything about it generic. The logos usually look just like this, just text. And I've seen a few track records that were pressed at this pressing plant. Uh, the vinyl, it's fairly low quality too. It's not styrene. I think it is vinyl. Yeah, it's vinyl. But um, pretty cheap. And I've often wondered why Track had to do that. Actually, by uh, putting on my glasses, I can see that it was actually distributed by Atlantic Recording Company, which was Atlantic Records. And it looks like Atlantic typefaces, but still with that super cheesy generic layout and graphic style. So if anybody knows anything about this, leave a comment. 
clue me in, clue everybody in who's watching Tent Talks Tunes, these mysterious pressing variants. And by the way, if you don't know the crazy world of Arthur Brown, you want to hear some wild, unhinged stuff from the late 1960s, check them out. The big hit was, of course, Fire, I Want You to Burn. Fire, I Want You to Learn, which was all over the radio on WQAM in Miami when I was a little kid. It's one of the first songs I remember hearing on the radio. Still a big favorite of mine. And it's completely nuts how, how a song that unhinged got to be such a big hit beyond me, but I'm glad it did. So this was the follow-up. Didn't sell quite as many. Great record for a buck. How am I going to say no? The answer is I'm not. Something else they had there, this is why I love Prowling the Cheat Bins, a sealed copy of the reissue of the fall, the Bingo Masters Breakout. I don't think I've ever really talked about how much I love the fall. Mark E. Smith and about 278,000 other players who came and went from the fall over their long and storied career. You would be pretty hard pressed to find a bad record by the fall. I mean, maybe some records by the fall stylistically wouldn't be your thing. Like they did some real techno inspired records in the 90s that I didn't really care for too much, but it's still the fall. This reissued one of their early 45s. Fantastic. Still sealed, colored vinyl, and the original price, let's see what the original price was. He had it marked down to six bucks. Six bucks for a sealed 45 these days, I think is pretty darn reasonable. The original price, which I cannot make out because the stickers are so stuck to each other, can't see it, but it used to be more than six. Maybe I can find out by looking at the stickers on the back. Nope, I can't figure it out. It was in the markdown bin anyway, and I love the markdowns, so I'm probably going to sell this one, but if I don't, I'm going to keep it. That's the beauty of my business. If nobody buys my wares, I get to keep them. Life is good. Something else in the cheap, cheap bin of Lunchbox Records. I have no idea what it is. It's on the Windian label. It's by a group called the Church Bats. The song on the side B is Half Man, Half Shellfish. The song on side A is called Foreign Land. It looks good. I like the name of the band. The song titles are intriguing. It was a buck. For a buck, I'll take a chance on almost anything, especially when it's a dollar in trade. A cash $1 bill like this Japanese government peso? Maybe, maybe not. But in trade, sure. For a buck, the church bats doing half man, half shellfish, I'll give it a shot. If it's any good, I'll let you people know. Fewer things more satisfying than spending one dollar on great music. You can hardly even download a track for a buck these days. And then, uh, let's see, I think that was my a take from Lunchbox Records. Yes, it was. So then I went over across town to Repo Records in Charlotte, North Carolina. Longtime supporters and friends of Anti Scene. And I talked to Jimmy over there. We did a little bit of bidness. And I got two records from Jimmy Repo. One of which was the kind of thing that, you know, normally I wouldn't do because you've heard me denounce Record Scam Day on many occasions. I think Record Store Day is something that started out as a very good idea, but of course, as all good ideas devolve, turned into a giant cash grab by corporate America. So now you've got all the major labels who I hate and who I hate for many, many, many good reasons clogging up all the pressing plants with, let's face it, a lot of bullshit so that labels like me, so that I have to wait nine months to get something off the press. I don't like that. And a big reason for that is record scam day. <sighs> Looking through the bins of record store day releases that are left over after Record Store Day, the, after the feeding frenzy has subsided. 
really irks me because I see a lot of worthless junk in there. Worthless junk. Total garbage. With an occasional worthwhile title sprinkled in. And it's those worthwhile titles that I live for. Now, have I caused any controversy by saying that? Do people out there watching have opinions about Record Store Day? Let's see what the monitor reveals. Let's see if I can uh, get some comments. And the monitor's not letting me read the comments, so I'll have to check your comments later. But I'm just very curious to know what you guys might think about Record Store Day. I personally am very jaundiced and cynical about the whole thing. But having said all that, when I see what is basically a completely unnecessary, pretty much unasked for, pretty much uncalled for, Record Store Day exclusive only release by one of my favorite bands, in fact, my favorite band of all time. I'm, of course, talking about Devo. Yes, I'm aware of the contradiction inherent in my long screed about how much I detest Record Scam Day, but, you know, when I saw the Devo Record Store Day picture disc in a limited edition of, what, 5,000 copies or so, Yeah, I did it. I did it. I did it. Do I need it? No. Was it necessary? No. Did I get it? Yes. I did it. I embrace the contradictions of the human condition. I love picture discs, man. Picture discs, picture discs are just cool. They really are. Look at that. That is art, my friends, and nothing but. So yeah, I succumbed. You're welcome to sue me if you want to. I'll give you my lawyer's name and address. You can give him a call, and I'm sure we can have a big, ugly, hideous court battle over my contradictory stance on this Record Store Day release. Human beings are so funny. Something else I got from Jimmy Repo, and this ties into another one of my magnificent, magnificent obsessions, and that is Grand Funk Railroad. Now, if you guys tuned in to break on through on the Anti-Scene Facebook page this last Tuesday, not yesterday, but the week before, you might have expected to see me and the long-haired weirdo himself, Jeff Clayton, talking about Grand Funk Railroad. We had a sort of loose plan to do that, but we ended up talking about so much other stuff that we never got around to Grand Funk, which is ironic because one of the things I found at Repo Records was a peripherally related Grand Funk item. And um, this is an album by a group called Mom's Apple Pie. Now, to get the full background on this, you should go, by all means, you should go to my YouTube channel and scroll back and look for the episode that I did on Terry Knight. Terry Knight was the manager of Grand Funk Railroad. And the story of Terry Knight is downright bizarre, you know, and the record business is full of stories left, right, and center that are downright bizarre. But even by the standards of the record industry, Terry Knight's story is a hell of a story. So check out that episode for a solid hour about Terry Knight and his incredibly ill-fated career. This ties in directly to that. Long story short, there's no one of them long story shorts, maybe a medium length story relating to this is that after Terry Knight parted ways with Grand Funk, very acrimoniously I should say, he tried to start his own label called Brown Bag Records. And the problem with Brown Bag Records, there are actually several problems. One of them was that by the time Terry Knight started Brown Bag Records, I believe that he believed his own hype. His own hype was that he could take any band from anywhere and turn them into stars just by hyping them. 
And the major signings to Brown Bag Records were his attempts to prove that. One of them was this group Mom's Apple Pie. Their first album had this whole contrived controversy over the album cover. It didn't work. They sold a fair amount of records immediately when the album came out because of the cover controversy. Then people listened to the record and they stopped buying it. But I guess the contract is a contract and I guess that Terry Knight had to do a second Mom's Apple Pie record, so he did. And here it is. And the reason why I got this, even though I already have a copy, you know, that's the way we roll here when we collect records. Why would I get a second copy of this? Because this copy had, has, the press kit inside of it. Yes, the press kit. Check this out. A deluxe printed folder, which mirrors the album cover, only a little bit smaller, a little bit flimsier. And inside the press kit, you've got all the great press kit stuff. You've got an 8x10 glossy. You've got a giant size fold-out poster. And you've got a band biography printed on very fancy yet supposedly lowbrow brown paper stationery. And this is like such a great example of Terry Knight believing his own hype. If you read the press release, it's it's a ridiculous press release. It goes it talks about how the band, well, I'll, I'll quote a little bit from you. Skyrocketing from total obscurity to the heights of relative obscurity overnight and midway into the next day comes mom's apple pie, exclamation mark. Right away, he's just tied the noose for his band with that opening sentence. He's created the noose, and now he's dangling it from the gallows. It goes on to say, uh, hat in hand, shoulder to the grindstone, and toting that bale is a 10-piece group of musicians which has already been referred to by leading publications as the dullest thing I ever heard. The best part of their record is the blank space between the songs. All right, so now with this press release, Terry Knight has taken the noose and put it over his band's neck. And it basically just kind of goes on like that in an attempt to be funny. I mean, I know the backstory behind this, and by the time I was, by the time I was finished reading with, by the time I finished reading this thing, I was ready to toss the record in the garbage can. And I know the story behind it. So imagine if you were a reviewer or a radio programmer, and you read that. You wouldn't play this thing. Of course you wouldn't. The triple irony is that these very expensive, fancy promo goods were paid for out of pocket by Terry Knight himself. The distribution deal that he signed with United Artists Records, who were going to do distribution on his product, said they would distribute it, but he had to pay for all the promo. So he violated a cardinal rule when it comes to major label record dealings. He was spending his own money to make these very fancy, very expensive press kits. And in doing so, he totally <laughs> slit the throat of his artist, who were, you know, they were okay. I mean, they were certainly not as bad as the press release would have you think they were. They were okay. They were sort of like a blood, sweat, and tears, Chicago Transit Authority sort of group. You know, those bands were happening, so these guys came along, and they kind of sounded like those bands, you know? Meat and Potatoes, rock band with a horn section. Whatever. But Terry Knight attempted to create his own negative hype, and it didn't work. And I do believe... I could be mistaken, that was the last thing ever released on Brown Bag Records. If it wasn't the last, it was close to being the last. So yeah, Terry Knight, fascinating story with quite the tragic ending, like literally. Look at the old uh, episode I have posted on YouTube and you'll see for yourself. That was the great city of Charlotte, North Carolina. And then from Charlotte... I headed a little bit north and east to another great city, Richmond, VA, which is the home of Vinyl Conflict Records. My good pal Bobby, the owner, 
and guiding light of vinyl conflict he's actually moving to a new expanded location even as we speak so i went over there not only to do some business but maybe to help move some boxes or and just shoot the shite which is what i did after a delicious vegan lunch in richmond mm -hmm. love that vegan chow baby so I went over to the new location we did some wheeling and dealing with tpos product I had some trade balance left over after the cash payout, and I got a few records. Oh, I got a few records. Let's talk about them. <laughs> I got a couple that are most likely, I'm most likely I'm going to flip these. LP of the very first demo recordings by Suicide from 1975. I have not heard this stuff yet. I am really dying to hear this. I think I'm going to do the modern thing and look it up on YouTube if it's posted. If it's good and I really, really like it, I'm just going to keep the album. If it doesn't totally float my belt, float my boat, I'm going to sell the mofo. Either way, I win. Brand new, still sealed. And reasonably priced. So yeah, Suicide, 1975 original demos. And I, I got to tell you, there is, that is one of the good things about whenever a format hits the market and becomes the new trendy format when cds first hit the market it was a bonanza for reissues and especially for previously unreleased material stuff that no one had ever heard before it was really exciting stuff had come out from the vaults that nobody even knew existed and now that vinyl is, you know, is making a comeback you know vinyl's making a comeback one of the upshots to that is that stuff like this, which I've never, I never knew there was a demo of theirs in 1975. It's out legit on a label and easy to get and easy to hear. Very exciting. And of course, there's a reissue of this one album, The Silver Apples, man. If you guys don't know The Silver Apples, I totally, totally love this album. The first album by The Silver Apples, early 1970s drummer and keyboard duo and Simeon the guy from the Silver Apples built all of his keyboards and electronics and this music sounds like no other music that was being made at that time it's really weird it's borderline creepy it's catchy as all get out I love the Silver Apples they did two albums before they broke up this is the first I can never decide if I like this one or the second one better. The second one's called Contact. They're both dynamite. And if I end up keeping this one, it'll be so that I can stop playing my original pressing, which I've just about worn out. But I might sell it too, you know, because the original still got some life in it. Win-win. So I just love finding things like this sitting in the bins of record stores and taking them home. There were a few other things that they had. Something that's not uh, particularly horribly rare, but still very, very cool. Original Beach Boys picture sleeve for Help Me Rhonda and Kiss Me Baby. Mike Love looking especially creepy as he comes at you from behind a tree. I would not want to meet that man in a dark alley. I would not want to meet him in a forest. I wouldn't want to meet him anywhere. Yeah. I just love these old Capitol Records picture sleeves. They're not very artistic, really, but they work. They definitely work. Very simple. Very effective. So that was pretty cool. And I've talked a lot about this one band who have one album that I love. Best Coast. Their album Crazy For You. It's just it's one of those albums that blows my mind that it is so effing good. Their second album, in my opinion, doesn't even come close. There's a bonus track on Crazy For You. It ain't that great. So, okay, one out of three. That ain't good, but that one is just so good that I couldn't help picking up this 45 of theirs, which was also in the cheap bin just on the on the hope on the off chance that it will be even half as good as that one album is because that one album is effing superb 
Haven't played it yet. Hope it's good. I'll let you guys know. If you guys have any opinions on this band, let me know. I'm curious. Saw them live a few years back, opening for the Go-Go's. They were okay. They were okay. I wouldn't mind seeing them as headliners. They would probably be, probably be better as headliners. Um, opening, they were okay. But man, that album Crazy for You is so... Woo, it's good. What else? Ha <laughs> ha. I have talked a little bit about bands who I basically don't like, but who have a handful of songs that just completely knock me out. And there were many, many comments posted on that show about similar bands. Here's one I forgot to mention. And this isn't even that band, really. This is a single by Sandy Shaw, the 1960s British pop singer. It's the song Hand in Glove. And it's backed with I Don't Owe You Anything. And it's Sandy Shaw backed by The Smiths. It's a Smiths record, but without Morrissey on lead vocals, which right away makes me probably want to like it a lot more than your average Smiths record. The Smiths have got a couple of songs that I just love, L-U-V, love. But man, their stuff is annoying by and large. Oh my God, it grates on my nerves. Even listening to those songs I really like, one is enough. Play that one song. Play the Headmaster Ritual once and then move on to another band. That's my relationship with the Smiths. But this one's really cool. Sandy Shaw on vocals. It's got the classic Smiths picture sleeve design. It's got the band credited right there in bold gray and red. It's got that great Rough Trade label layout from the mid-80s. Very simple. No frills. You know exactly what it is. I was pleasantly surprised to find that one in the bin. I'm probably going to flip this one at some point. And here's another one, another record scam day piece of bullshit, but I couldn't, I couldn't resist because it was so cheap. This dates back to, uh, well, I guess I'll look at the date in a minute. You know, plain black sleeve, low, low price tag took it out what did i see i saw some pretty groovy colored vinyl and on the a side it's the ramones doing sheena is a punk rocker and on the b side it's who's Do doing sheena is a punk rocker two more of my absolute all-time favorite bands in the world let's see this is from record store day i can't read it because these are very weak dollar store glasses don't know when this thing was made it is as most of these things are a completely unnecessary piece of junk. There is no need for this whatsoever. There was probably no demand for it whatsoever, which is why it was in the cheap bin. But I, being that contradictory fanboy record collector that I am, I got it anyway. Remember, if you want to sue me, personal message me and I'll give you my lawyer's information. And your lawyer and my lawyer can talk about it. And that'll make them really happy because you know, they, they charge by the minute. So let's make our lawyers rich, shall we? Yes. Let's. A toast to paying lawyers by the minute. Next to last item that I got at the record stores. Something I never knew existed, and this goes back to what I said earlier about, you know, since vinyl is so trendy and hip and all these really amazing recordings are coming to light that I never knew about. Imagine my surprise when I saw this record by The Red Lights, which was Jeffrey Lee Pierce's band before The Gun Club from 1978. Apparently the only recorded evidence of them at all was this five song demo that had never even been rumored before and I've, I've collected hours and hours and hours of gun club live recordings and demos and studio outtakes and radio broadcasts and all that stuff i had no idea that the red lights have recorded anything it's only five songs but it's pretty good it's pretty good it doesn't sound like the gun club per se but you can definitely tell it's jeffrey lee pierce and this my friends in my opinion is a is a 
an issue that is worthwhile. It's not a record scam day piece of Franklin Mint junk. This is valid. This is art, baby. Nice cover. Cool inner sleeve with liner notes. And some groovy, if you can see, translucent sort of red vinyl. Okay, yeah, you can see that. Look at that. I am not an endorser of this product. I just happen to like it. And the last thing I picked up at the record store, this was at Vinyl Solution. I am not only a member of the band, I am a raving fan. And for some reason, I did not have the split 7-inch between Anti-Scene and Brody's Militia. Can you imagine I didn't have this record by the band I'm in? I mean, if you are aware of how gigantic the anti-scene discography is, you can probably understand why I don't have every single Verschluggener record they ever released. There are some people who have come very close, John Adam, to name but one. But even John Adam, I think he'll admit that he doesn't have them all. He does not have every single one of them. I was missing this one. So I was delighted to find this. Yes. It's on some funky green vinyl. Hope you can see that. And it features the band that I'm in right now doing Fix Me by Black Flag. And then alternate versions of Nothing's Cool and I Don't Ask You For Nothing with a doomsday intro. I haven't even heard this one yet. Better believe I will before the game is up. So my anti-scene collection becomes more and more complete as the seconds tick on by, which makes me an even happier dude than I am now. So everybody, I want to thank you guys for tuning in. It is always my pleasure to just yap, rap, and snap endlessly about music about coins, about fine, fun, funky stuff. I didn't even mention that the one that the dollar coin that my good pal Dennis sent me is the 1976 bicentennial version of the Eisenhower dollar, and that the Eisenhower dollar is perhaps the single ugliest coin minted by the United States of America. That's my opinion, and I'm sticking with it. But I collect it anyway. So yes, thank you to everybody for tuning in and turning on and dropping out of your minds with Tent Talks Tunes. I got lots of tunage to talk about in the near future and in the far future, which I will be doing. Don't forget my YouTube channel. Subscribe to it. Don't forget my website, MalcolmTent.net, which is your clearinghouse for all things related to little old me. My record label, TPOS, on Discogs, on eBay, and on Bandcamp. Check it out. If you find it to be even as remotely rewarding as I have for the last 39 years, then you will be living a rich, rich life. I do intend to be back in about 167 hours time until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State. <laughs>